Oh. Yep, that's how I felt when I first read this New England Journal of Medicine study. People were sitting to me like crazy saying, Thomas, this study says that intermittent fasting has no extra effect over caloric restriction. All the benefits are the same. So when I first looked at that, I'm like, wow, this is a punch in the face to the fasting community. But then I looked at the study and I'm like, wow, this is a well-crafted study and it was done really well. So I figure, let's break this down and really understand the nuance of it. Because when we look at caloric restriction and we look at fasting, there are a ton of similarities. And this study ultimately determined that time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting was not more beneficial for weight loss, for fat loss, or for metabolic risk factors compared to caloric restriction. When they looked at those two groups, they all got the same positive outcome. So yeah, it does seem like a punch in the face to the fasting community, but the answer probably lies somewhere in the middle. It's probably less about caloric restriction being the king or fasting being the king and a little bit of both. So what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna break down the study, we're gonna break down some of the nuance, then we're gonna get down to the negatives and the positives of the study itself, and then we're gonna get down to things that probably could have been done differently and things that should be investigated to really understand which is better, if you wanna call it that. Go ahead and check out Thrive Market if you wanna save 25% off your entire grocery order. They're today's video sponsor. And because you're watching this video, that means that you save 25% off your whole grocery order. So that link is down below. You go online, you order your groceries, they get delivered to your doorstep. You can sort by fasting, you can sort by paleo, you can sort by all kinds of things, autoimmune paleo, whatever your dietary strategy is, you can shop by that category and then it's at your doorstep in just a couple of days. But again, the best part, you save 25% off and get a free gift when you use the special link that's down below in the description. So check out Thrive after this video. Let's look at the study design first. Okay, so this study took a look at 139 people. Okay, 139 people that were technically obese by BMI standards. Now that doesn't always mean a lot because technically I'm obese by BMI standards. So we can't always look at that. But what it did is it divided them into two groups, a time-restricted eating group that fasted and only ate between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. and a caloric restriction group that could really eat whenever. Okay, now, now for men, they consumed between 1,500 and 1,800 calories. And for women, they consumed between 1,200 and 1,500 calories. They ate a diet of about 40 to 55% carbohydrates, 15 to 20% protein, and about 20 to 30% fat. Now that's the first hole that I would poke just from a health perspective, but it's not a study design. I would definitely say, let's try to get that protein more to like 30, 35%, but that's neither here nor there. It really doesn't matter for this particular study. They did this for a whole year. That's what I like about the study. It was a year long study. For the first six months, they had them log and take a picture of everything that they ate. And then after that, the following six months, they only had to do it a few days per week. So yeah, there's room for error there. People could totally cheat. People could forget. People only had to take pictures a few days a week. Who knows what would happen, but you have enough data there that you're hoping it's all honest. The results are what were really, really shattering for people, especially in the fasting community. From the weight loss side of things, they said there was no statistical significance in weight loss between fasting and caloric restriction. The fasting group lost eight kilograms in total of a year, okay, whereas the caloric restriction group lost 6.3 kilograms. When it came down to fat loss, they also said there was no statistical significant difference. Okay, 5.9 kilograms of fat loss versus 4.5 kilograms of fat loss in the caloric restriction group. They also said that there was no statistical significance in postprandial glucose levels and no statistical significance in what's called HOMA IR, which is your, basically your marker for insulin resistance. So let me give you my interpretation of this, okay? Because this is what's intriguing. I am not a statistician, okay? I, I can't look at statistics and understand the way that a, a biostatistician could and really understand things. But I can still look at enough data to see when things are pointing one way or the other. All the study outcomes in this pointed towards fasting as having slightly more benefit than caloric restriction. So let's take a look at what that is, because from the weight loss side, it was eight kilograms versus 6.3 kilograms weight lost. To me, that is not statistically insignificant, but I'm not a statistician. I can't tell you, maybe there's other things that I'm not adjusting for, right? So at first I'm like, that's a lot more weight loss. Then from the fat loss side, 1.4 kilograms more fat loss in the time-restricted eating group compared to the caloric restriction group. 
Okay, that doesn't sound like much, but when you consider that it was 5.9 kilograms of fat loss total and 4.5 kilograms of fat loss total, we're talking more than 25% of the entire fat loss, like more with the fasting group. So that's really interesting. And then when we get into the glucose stuff, fasting glucose was lower in the fasting group. Okay. Postprandial glucose after eating was markedly lower in the fasting group than in the caloric restriction group. After six months, it was a difference of 15.4 versus 10.6. But then after that first six months, things balanced out and it ended up about the same. Okay, so what that potentially indicates is that maybe there was a quicker response because the caloric restriction was more aggressive with fasting and it balanced out in the end. But HOMA IR, the marker of insulin resistance, ended up having a decrease of 1.0 in the fasting group and a decrease of 0.5 in the caloric restriction group. But here's where things get twisted because I look at that and I say, that is not statistically insignificant to me. That looks like fasting is working better. But then you start going through the data and you realize the fasting group consumed less calories ultimately. The fasting group consumed on average 1,439 calories per day, whereas the caloric restriction group consumed on average 1,571 calories per day. So just by nature of how they were eating and their structure, the caloric restriction group was actually eating about 150 calories more per day. So could that difference account for why it was statistically insignificant? Okay, because when you look at that, you say, well, okay, yeah, the fasting group actually ended up eating less. So is this a light switch that's flipping that is triggering all these benefits when we get into the caloric deficit? Or is it a dimmer switch? When we're fasting, are we cranking that dimmer switch even more and getting more effect because we're in a more extreme form of caloric deficit? Let's not fool ourselves. Okay, when we fast, we are aiming for the benefit of a caloric deficit. There's all these other cool benefits we talk about, but a lot of them do stem from being in a caloric deficit. But is a caloric deficit black and white? Or is a caloric deficit something that gets cranked even harder if it's a harder caloric deficit? The difference between someone that's in a 100 calorie deficit compared to someone that hasn't eaten any food and is at a like 3,000 calorie deficit, but also compare that to someone that's at a 3,000 calorie deficit that goes out and runs a marathon, and puts themselves in even more of a deficit. Who's getting more benefit, right? It's an interesting question. We should all ask ourselves that. Now, I wanna start with some of the drawbacks here because there is one huge, huge confounder in this study, like a really confusing thing that I don't know why they didn't monitor. Probably the biggest flaw. They didn't measure activity. They didn't account for expenditure. So no one had to track like how much activity they were doing or how much they were exercising. So we don't know, like maybe the fasting group felt really good and started exercising more. They're probably, I don't know who, who knows, right? Like I've talked to people that feel that way. When they start fasting, they have more energy, so they exercise more, but we don't know. So we don't know what the real deficit is. There's a rigid nutritional guideline, a rigid caloric intake that people needed to follow with no regard whatsoever for exercise and how much they were expending which when you look at the world of AMPK phosphorylation, when you look at the world of autophagy, when you look at the world of mTOR, that whole piece, exercise plays such a huge role. So to take that out of the equation or just activity in general, not even exercise, quote unquote, it's so important to monitor that. But now let's look at some of the positives. There's a 12 month study that gives you a lot of like wiggle room with error because things wash out. There were a large amount of people Okay, they also had like 84% adherence, which is really good. Okay, a lot of people finished the study, okay, whereas that's not the same for a lot of other metabolic studies. So when you look at this kind of thing, it's pretty interesting, it's a well-crafted study. And at the end of the day, it shows positives either way. Okay, the study wasn't designed to throw intermittent fasting under the bus. What ends up happening is the media takes that and throws fasting under the bus. The study was actually pretty clear and the researchers seemed relatively shocked at the results because they were more leaning towards intermittent fasting advocates to begin with. But still, I look at this and I say, okay, well, what is a big problem that Thomas DeLauer would find with this? If you watch my content a lot, you know that yes, I like 16-8 fasting, 16 hours fasting, eight hours eating, but we have a big flaw with it. That really is eerily similar to caloric restriction, right? It is, like it's not that far off. All you're really doing is like skipping one meal. You're not consolidating that much. Why does it work so well for people then? Because psychologically, I think 16-8 is tremendous. I think it really works well for people to just be able to put themselves in a box so they can adhere to it and they can sustain it and they can do it for a long amount of time, okay? But when you start looking at the benefits that would come from fasting, I think the benefits come much more from a hormetic stressor side of things when you start doing slightly longer fasts 
20 hours, 22 hours, 24 hours, but less frequently. People doing 16 hour fasts every day, I have said this in many videos before, and sometimes people really flame me for this, but that isn't a whole lot different from caloric restriction. It's just really not. Okay, because you need more time to really diminish those insulin levels, if that's your goal. If your goal is to have a positive impact on insulin and to decrease insulin resistance and work towards that, you need to have some longer fasts. Because 16 hours is tremendous for it, but so is caloric restriction. I think the benefits start coming in as you do these longer fasts. So it would be interesting to see a study that looked at this with longer fasts, similar study design, but with longer fasts so that we could see hey, the hormetic stressor. Because the things that weren't looked at here, they weren't looking at sirtuins, they weren't looking at FOXO3 and like longevity genes, they weren't looking at stress response, they weren't looking at exercise, lactate clearance. And these are the things that I typically talk about with fasting. We know that fasting helps you lose weight. We know that caloric restriction helps you lose weight. I beg the other questions. What about cognitive function? What about ways that by building more resiliency from fasting and the hormetic stressor involved with it, are we making ourselves more cognitively aware? Is there a reason why people utilize ketones for cognitive function? You get deeper in a fast and you start producing ketone bodies, whether you're doing a ketogenic diet or not. Okay, then we have the autophagy side of things. Now what's funny is that the fasting community really likes to hold a lot of weight with autophagy. And I understand it because you probably get into that autophagic state like faster because you are putting yourself into severe caloric restriction. But most of the research actually suggests that autophagy is a result of caloric restriction. Fasting might just get you there faster. And the question that comes again, is it a dimmer switch or is it a light switch? Does autophagy just turn on when we're in a deficit or does it turn on more when we're in a deeper deficit, right? So it's really confusing. Again, a thing that we should all be asking ourselves and we should really beg for some studies that look at this kind of thing too so we can really take a holistic look and say, hey, this one is better for XYZ, this one is better for ABC because I don't think anyone's denying that we all eat too much and a caloric deficit is probably a good thing. But when you have people that become so dogmatic about whatever way they think, that all gets pushed aside and it becomes a one-sided argument of who can shout the loudest. This study was well-crafted, but it also illuminated what we need to look at more. So maybe we should reframe and flip the script a little bit. Instead of using it to fight, maybe we can say, hey, caloric restriction crowd, hey, calories in, calories out crowd, hey, we're on the same page. Losing weight is good, calories in, calories out is good. We understand that, okay? Let's start looking at other things here. And let's start looking at things that we can achieve to be better people and to live for a healthier, longer life. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.